Okay, I think we're uh, I think we're ready to go. I've got four o'clock. We good? Okay, welcome to uh, the Environmental and Remediation Opportunities Panel. Um, glad you're glad you're all here. I was just telling the panel members. Um, I, I'm not sure what the what the deal is. The last session was AE opportunities, and this was wall to wall and standing room in the back. Um, um, I always thought environmental was maybe the bigger part of uh, some of the business of SAME members, but uh, obviously that's not the case. Or, or the, uh, maybe it's four o'clock. Maybe it's the fact that uh, the Army, Navy, and the Air Force have made their environmental programs perfectly clear to everybody, and um, and no and nobody needs any more information. Um, I don't think that's the case. Um, I'm in the I'm in the environmental business and. Uh, there's always more. There's always more you can know and uh, more info you can get. We've got we've got three good speakers today from the Army, the uh, Lakes and Rivers Division Deputy Paul, Colonel Paul Kramer um, from the uh, from the Navy, Miss Gunarty Coughlin from uh, NAFAC headquarters, and from the Air Force, Colonel Jason Campbell, Deputy Director um, of Environmental Management at AFCEC. So I'm I'm looking forward to a good afternoon. Um, some good presentations and and take notes, but opportunity to uh, to ask some questions at the end. And uh, a couple I'd like you to think about is what is it that you really want to know that they didn't cover? And I don't think anybody will hesitate to ask that one. Uh, the other one that I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the panel, and you may think about and have suggestions, is what could industry be doing to help um, our DoD clients? And, and I think, I think uh, that kind of got teed up uh, earlier today from, uh, from uh, Lucian and from uh, General Seminite, but uh, something to think about as we, as we go through the, um, the afternoon here. Couple of, uh, couple of announcements. Um, emergency exit. If we have an emergency, go straight out those doors and across the hall, there are exit signs to stairways down to the street. There's one down there, one here, um, easy, to, easy to get out. Hopefully, everybody has silenced your phones so we don't have any, uh, any interference. Um, we would like to, to thank the sponsors again for the overall conference. Um, couldn't happen without, without sponsors, so thank all of you who are here. Um, you all got scanned coming in. SAME is going to use that data to um, provide market research analytics uh, for, the, for the conference. Um, the presentations are being recorded. So as we ask questions, I'd like you to be sure, and, and I'll walk around, but if you got a question, raise your hand, wait till I get the mic to you, then speak into the mic, let us know who you are, where you're from, and, and ask your question. But it is being recorded. The slides themselves will be available on the uh, SEME website soon after the conference, and the recorded sessions will also be available, so somebody, if they want to listen to the Q&A and hear what everybody had to say, can do that. I think that's it. Um, our, first, our first presenter is uh, Colonel Paul Kramer, the uh, Deputy Division Commander from the Lakes and Rivers Division. Um, the Lakes and Rivers Division is uh, one of the Corps' biggest Colonel Kramer, uh, the deputy there, is going to present on the entire Corps environmental program, however. So you're going to see information that covers everybody from, uh, from, from New England and uh, North Atlantic Division to, to POD. So a big area, a lot of information. Um, some of it, I don't know, do, who do we have in here from other Corps divisions besides lakes and rivers? Jeez. Colonel Kramer's well represented by his commanders from the Lakes and Rivers Division down here, um, but obviously there are there are seven other divisions in the Huntsville Center who uh, who aren't here. So there may be questions that come up that really need to go to those um, other core divisions around some of the issues in the in the core program, uh, and I would encourage you all to visit the core booths downstairs. Uh, same for, for NAFAC and, uh, and AFCEC. So, with no further uh, interruptions, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Colonel Paul Kramer.
All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Again, I'm Paul Kramer. I'm the Deputy Commander of the Great Lakes and High River Division. Uh, so what do I do? I, as with any good deputy, I do what my boss doesn't want to do. Uh, so, so the second year in a row I'm here uh, with you all. And now it's not uh, anything against my boss. Uh, he just keeps getting Army taskers to go other places. So I was real excited when he had to go elsewhere and I had to come here uh, for this great event. And I guess based on the last couple of years, I should already make reservations for Dallas next year because... <laughs> I'm sure he'll get tasked again, and I'll be uh, right here with you. And then since it's on YouTube, I guess I'll find my six- and eight-year-old looking at this video in, in a week or so. Where I can't find stuff, but they always find amazing stuff on YouTube, uh, much to my chagrin. Uh, bottom line up front, I am here today to talk to you about the FY19 program for the Army and the Corps of Engineers uh, for environmental remediation. I was talking to Tim earlier. You know, I'm definitely not an expert in this area. I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Uh, but... The value of having the colonels here in front from our districts here in uh, LRD is that uh, while we're a little bit more older, you know, why are all these colonels around sometimes? Well, I think the real reason we know and why the colonels are around is when we're survivors, uh, we've been through a lot overseas and through our organizations, just like many of you out here have survived many uh, challenges in your lives, but we also know people. So if you do have a, an issue and you're trying to find a certain district or a certain project and you don't understand some of the acronyms, uh, the easy button is to go to the people in uniform are very obvious around here and we will help you find that person that you need to help answer those questions. Now obviously we can't do anything we do without our army civilians. Uh, so there's plenty of our USA civilians but you know sometimes they blend in a little better than we do here in uniform. Um, so again we'll go ahead and get started. So bottom line who are we? Right. So again so if you're new to the, what USACE is the bottom line is USACE um, we tackle some of the toughest environmental challenges out there and I've seen several of these projects that our district commanders are intimately aware of. We have multidisciplinary, highly specialized professionals, uh, just like your organizations, and they help find solutions to amazingly complex, uh, sensitive situations out there in our communities uh, throughout the country. And so what are our roles? So if you're kind of looking at what the three main areas are, uh, you can read them on the screen there, but you know, restore impacted ecosystems, balance those mission requirements, and then continue, contribute to resiliency. So in my own words, you know, kind of fix what's broken that's out there in our environment, uh, balance those current missions with our, uh, what, what we can do for the environment without destroying things. You know, in the Cold War, we were definitely mission focused and unfortunately now, 50 years later, we're kind of still cleaning up a lot of those maybe mistakes we made because the urgency to rush into certain tasks. And then lastly, you know, can we harden our environment just a tiny bit, make it more resilient uh, we've seen over the last years all the storms and you know, there's threats of rising uh, water levels. So what can we do to help our communities out with the environment uh, so we're not having uh, so many impacts? Uh, you know, personally, I track about five to ten projects across the division. I you know, watch whether the district commanders know it or not. Just things I know of interest. And in. through one of those projects, I've been able to watch our Pittsburgh district deal with some amazingly complex issues dealing with the old Manhattan project. Uh, and dealing with some stuff, I'll just leave it at that, in the ground that we have to take care of. So I know our workforce is there, ready to work through this, and hopefully through your expertise, you know, as contractors, you can help us actually move the dirt and make uh, things happen in this area. So a quick program overview. As you all know, with any federal agency, we work with federal agencies, the state, local governments, and all those stakeholders trying to figure out solutions to these complex problems. If they're easy, whatever we get them done, you know, no problem. But these are real complex environmental challenges we face and have been facing for decades. And bottom line, while you're here is, you know, without our contractors, nothing's going to change on the ground. We're not going to move any dirt, like our ASA always says. Um, so we need you. Uh, and in fact, a significant part of our business, environmental, goes to small business, which is a great opportunity for everyone here. So this slide kind of shows the extent of where we are in terms of environmental. So as you can see, it's pretty much every corner of the, of the country. And these are all the active projects and the projects that we're monitoring. Uh, so again, it's uh, no matter pretty much where your company may be located, there's something in a nearby community that we are either again, monitoring, planning for the future, or actively uh, doing some sort of remediation. Of course, in today's world, data matters. Uh, without question, data matters. Good data matters. Uh, so this graphic kind of shows where the federal funding environmental went in FY18. You know, so as you can see, if you've got BRAC or FUDS or FUSRAP experience, 
uh, with your team, you can see where less opportunities were found. Uh, and in fact, you know, the FUDs increased, you know, $40 million last year. Foods wrap increased $20 million due to congressional plus ups. So again, the, the program seems pretty healthy. All right, so, you know, hopefully you're in the right uh, session here. Um, these are the three NAICS codes. I'll show the opportunities here, the second half of the presentation. So again, these are kind of the areas I looked at across all the uh, divisions across the Corps of Engineers. So for this next code, environmental services, um, you can see that last year about one and a half billion dollars were awarded. And you can see on the right-hand side what went to small business. So a pretty good portion, you know, $778 million uh, out of that uh, next code went to small business. Now, of course, this is bigger than just environmental, granted, uh, but you can see it was a pretty good representation for small business. And now if this is your specialty, environmental consulting services, you can again see about $147 million last year. USAID's uh, awarded in contracts and about $41 million, so a little bit lesser percentage went to small business in this area. And then for the late, last next code we're discussing here today, you can see uh, again the core awarded in remediation services, you know, almost $800 million last year. And a fairly not good number, 143 million went to small business. And again, you can kind of see the breakdowns, uh, what, you know, whether you're a you know, small disadvantaged, women-owned, uh, service disabled, uh, kind of where those uh, monies went to. And so again, those kind of slides kind of show you the perspective of last year as you try to plot the, uh, the way forward for your companies. And now as always, you know, regardless of whether you're in government or outside of government, partners and um, Battle buddies, what, what we would call, you know, matter. So if you are looking for a partner and maybe there is a project you can't uh, do on your own or you know is too big for you, here's a top 10 list over the last two FYs that we saw in environmental. You know, who had kind of the biggest monies awarded to them. And so those are those additional partners besides just talking to us as you're walking the halls downstairs or you know, you're going to other opportunities for business. You go out there and try to find those battle buddies to figure out is there a way for you to team up and work together to get those core awards. So now begin to probably the, again, a little tough for me to brief sometimes, but uh, this is you know, our slides for those opportunities that we see in FY19 and, and also in FY20. So on the slide, it's, you know, this is for LRD, this is my home. Uh, there's five opportunities we're seeing uh, out there on the horizon. And the, probably the biggest thing I tell you to look at is, besides the booth number, of course, is look at that district. So for us here on this slide, you can see Buffalo, Chicago, and Detroit. And I think all the commanders are right here in front of me. Uh, maybe you know, two out of three, I can see. Um, but when you go to those booths, you know, at 445, for instance, you're looking at you know, the first one, the Big John Salvage, you gotta look for the, the Buffalo team. You know, so that's how you kind of narrow your search, make use of your, better use of your time so you can hit more booths. So again, that's kind of the, one of the key columns you look at, besides that obviously the project name and title, trying to figure out what opportunity applies to your company, what do you think you have good expertise in, you go and try and find those POCs, not just the guy in uniform or the, or the lady, but more importantly, the, our civilian teammates, those small business chiefs for those districts. They're the ones that can really pull you in, give you the right information and get you moving. All right, so now I have two slides for MVD. This is our Mississippi Valley Division. And they're based out of Vicksburg, Mississippi. So pretty much any waterways that ties in Mississippi, going from St. Paul all the way down to New Orleans, that's kind of their focus. They're kind of right there in the center of the country. Uh, but as you can see all their, their projects here. Now, one note, I did try and research a project two from each one, that that Piazza and Eagle's Nest uh, project there, kind of in the middle with St. Louis, very interesting project. They're actually um, uh, doing some dredging and island building. So we're trying to do some of that with our Buffalo district up in the Great Lakes. You know, with beneficial use of dredge material, again, trying to think out of the box. You know, bottom line, we're running out of a lot of space in some of our CDFs where we take that fill material and where do you put it? Uh, and we have states that don't allow us for open lake placement and you just can't go take that dredge material and put it elsewhere. What are some creative ways to use that material? Uh, so again, as, a, as our chief mentioned this morning, if you have those great ideas and have other ide you know, techniques or ways of doing business, please let us know. We're looking for better solutions for our country. And this is the second slide. Uh, this up, again, northern part up in the St. Paul District, the very northern part of uh, MVD's AO. 
All right, so now this is for North Atlantic Division. So if you're kind of in the Northeast, uh, coming off the highs of a recent World Series championship, uh, you can kind of look at some of these opportunities. The, the first one I highlight is our environmental say talk. It's kind of interesting. It's a um, pretty good number there, but it's based around Fort Belvoir. So it's environmental restoration, environmental compliance, and some natural resources work are all there at Fort Belvoir. So if you're familiar with the D.C. area or that's where you have uh, your team's located, it might be of interest to you. The second one is also interesting. I actually dabbled in this program a little bit when I was at the Pentagon. Uh, that is the actual uh, disposal, dismantling uh, of a shutdown nuclear reactor on Fort Belvoir. So if you have specialties in that area, that's, a, again, a pretty healthy contract number, but it's going to be a very complex project. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, please talk to the NAD um, individuals. And again, for the Red Sox fans, for the teams up around the Boston area, here's four more opportunities you might be interested in uh, there up in the Northeast. All right, moving along to the Northwest Division, so going up in our great north Northwest. Well, I don't have any specifics, because these are all Maytox for the next two slides. And when I talk to their POC, the, the good thing, well, you know, sometimes you can be a little fearful Maytox, maybe it won't all get used, you know, et cetera. They're pretty confident that, based on their track record, all their Maytox get used. Uh, so there's not that maybe the little hesitancy whether this is really worth your time, but uh, they're pretty confident that uh, they're consistently using all their Maytox up. And that is their second slide. All right, so if you were at the A&E brief a little while ago, you heard Colonel Tickner talk, or General Tickner talking about uh, opportunities, OCONUS, you know, outside of the continental U U.S. So here's a bunch of opportunities in Honolulu especially. And what's interesting for them is uh, a lot of UXO, the munitions, unexploded ordnance work that they have to do. Um, so some interesting facts in them is they have over 1.9 million acres of, in, in their area that are affected by these unexploded munitions. So a lot of work uh, to still be done. And then some other facts, 2,500 explosives have been destroyed, 29,000 acres have been cleared, and 250 tons of old munitions have already been disposed of in the past 15 years. So they're making progress, but it's still a lot of work to be done out there on the island. And one last slide also got some opportunities in Alaska and the Far East. Moving to SAD, so these are the folks that seem to keep finding their way into hurricanes, unfortunately. Uh, they only have two opportunities right now for environmental, both the Mobile District. So again, if these kind of pique your interest, uh, whether it's the NAICS code or the actual project name, be sure you're talking with the Mobile District Commander, uh, Colonel Jolly. Moving to SPD, again, go back out to the West Coast, so a lot of work in Albuquerque and Sacramento. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't have a whole lot of resolution yet, so there's a lot of TBDs. So you're definitely going to have to go talk to their small business chiefs down at their booth to figure out if there are more details uh, they can provide you. And that is their second slide. All right, hopefully most of the shots are taken. All right, uh, SWD, uh, they have uh, a lot of opportunities, obviously, with the Tulsa district. So if you find their booth, they have a lot of great districts, but if I had to talk to one district commander and one district uh, small business chief, it'd be the Tulsa district, without question. Uh, they obviously had the majority of the work for SWD in the next year. And, and the last of the kind of the charts here is HNC. Uh, so Huntsville, kind of unique, as you can see by the place of the performance, they have a very you know, worldwide program. They're not restricted by geographical boundaries. So if you are more open worldwide, wherever you need to go for the work, uh, these uh, individuals have big monies and big projects around the world. And you see whether it's uh, nationwide, a Maytok, Japan, and then the various locations for the Navy and Marine Corps. So subject to uh, what, what the needs are with them. And the only thing I mentioned with, uh, kind of what the chief mentioned this morning, again, we hope it's not just a one time a year event with a small business conference that you come together and talk to our districts, you talk to uh, all the, our wonderful teammates here in the Corps of Engineers. Uh, this is just an example from the Great Lakes and High River Division. There's, there's plenty of other opportunities to engage with us. You know, we call them business opportunities, uh, open houses. I've been to several of those with our district commanders. And it's another great opportunity to stay connected throughout the year, not just a one-time-a-year event. So if you really want to get uh, 
more knowledgeable in how the core works and what opportunities continue to change because everything changes every every 30 to 60 days it seems like the way to do that is be sure you stay engaged there's small business chiefs in those districts wherever you're located or wherever you're looking for work and then if you do struggle even uh, this week with this, you know the next uh, i guess two days almost uh, here are the phone numbers for all those small business chiefs at the division level so if you do run out of time and your Friday afternoon just frustrated you didn't get a chance you know if you can't find these slides uh, be sure you exploiting those uh, POCs that are on the slide, or at least their phone numbers. All right, so for a closing, um, bottom line, to reiterate what the drum somebody said, we need your involvement, we need your ideas, we need your teams. Uh, nothing's gonna get done without, you know, without our contractors. Uh, we do very a very small percentage of our work in-house. Uh, so bottom line, we need you. And I'll also say that uh, while most of the data points covered FY18, we're seeing pretty much consistent FY19 funding environmental. Uh, you may have thought maybe two years ago, based upon events in our country, we'd maybe see a decline in environmental work, but we are seeing it remain steady. And I think that's bottom line. Our nation recognizes and our Congress recognizes that the need is there. Uh, a lot of things were damaged in our country years ago, and maybe just due to the lack of knowledge of what the products we were using and the techniques we were doing, uh, but it remains a priority, and we see a, a steady program going forward. So subject to any questions, that's all I have for today. Thank you. Thanks. Let me get this rolled up. There we go. Okay, thanks, uh, Colonel Kramer. The, uh, our second presenter is uh, NAFAC, uh, Ms. Gunarty. Coughlin and uh, Gunardi is an environmental engineer. She's uh, on the NAV, NAVFAC Environmental Restoration Division. I think something interesting about Gunarti, though, and uh, probably isn't going to come up in the presentation, but you can ask about it afterwards. She's a leader in the initiative to promote innovation in uh, remediation and restoration. And uh, I think that's a place where a lot of folks are trying to go. Um, in industry, we're looking for new ways to be able to do things. And uh, it's good to see somebody who's involved in, uh, in that initiative. Uh, Gennardi, the floor is yours. Can you see me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm so glad that I actually have a step stool today. Anyway, um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, this is my second year providing the brief on the, oh, it doesn't show. Oh, is it on screen? Um, okay, audio visual, can you help us? Is it sleeping? Huh. Where's our AV guy? Okay, sorry. Uh, Hold on. Yes. Yes, I got it. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So um, anyway, so this is my second year. So oh. can you hear me? Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to go through uh, the overview of the Department of the Navy environmental programs. Um, because of my background, probably I will be biased toward environmental remediation, but uh, please do ask questions. If I do not know the answer, I will make sure that I point it out to the correct resources. Um, I have with me uh, from NAFAC, uh, Michael Caro uh, from NAFAC headquarters. Um, he asked me to not make him stand up, but can you stand up? 
Sorry. And then I have Bianca Henderson, and she's the director of Office of Small Business Programs with NAFAC. So if you have any question, please. Um, and then if between the three of us, we cannot answer the question, then now we'll make sure that we point it out. Uh, also, our booth is booth 1243. Um, yes, please visit. Um, okay, here we go. So what are the uh, products and services that, so uh, NAFAC is the uh, providers for uh, implementing and executing the Department of the Navy environmental program. So what we have, um, environmental planning, uh, NEPA, um, that is uh, one of uh, major uh, business products. We have natural and cultural resources, um, conservation plans, uh, compliance. Um, that's another uh, big uh, product. Um, we have to comply with federal, state, and local regulation and installation restoration. So we have the conventional installation restoration, uh, chemical contamination, radiological contamination, as well as munition response. So these are our uh, point of deliveries we have all over the world. Um, I think we're really lean, uh, but hopefully we're efficient. So um, not so many points as the army. Okay, so the challenges and focus areas, um, drinking water. So we have, um, Everyone familiar with environmental programs, uh, emerging contaminants, emerging issues, right? So drinking water, um, not only that we have um, compliance within the US, however, we also have to deal with overseas drinking water compliance as well. So um, that, um, please look at the opportunity in that uh, arena. As I mentioned, emerging contaminants and um, issues, uh, PFAS, uh, PER, and uh, polychlorinated uh, fluorinated alkyl substances, uh, one for dioxin. So emerging contaminants are um, constituents that are not quite regulated by EPA. So therefore, there are um, no standards available. And then as uh, the Army mentioned earlier, uh, AFFFs, um, aqueous film forming foam for uh, fire retardant, um, the legacy form of the AFFFs, uh, replacement and disposal, that's another area. Uh, complex groundwater sites, um, we have sites where we run pump and treat system for more than 30 years. Um, not only that uh, the infrastructures are old, however, uh, some of the sites, we're not even quite sure whether we can actually meet the remedial action objectives. So can we meet MCLs with those um, pump and treat system technologies? So many of our sites that operate pump and treat system, we need to relook and um, reassess whether we can actually get to um, the endpoint using the technology that we have. Vapor intrusion, where um, we have um, building occupied, um, where we have vapor problem from groundwater into uh, the indoor, um, uh, indoor air in the building. Munition response, the Navy has a uh, quite large size of uh, underwater uh, munition sites. And the technology right now, it's not um, catching up yet. Uh, so some of us are still working on how do we even characterize and identify munition objects underwater? Um, how do we tell whether those are munition objects or not? And how accurate uh, the technologies are. So, so we are uh, struggling with that problem. Uh, low level radiological cleanup. Um, we 
still also have that to catch up. So right now we're doing historical radiological assessment and some of the sites will turn into um, site needing preliminary assessment, um, maybe site investigation, maybe RI and then uh, response action. NEPA, um, we, the Guam buildup, for example, um, so we have to deal with how do we uh, expand uh, the requirements from the customer versus the requirements from uh, the regulators. Um, environmental liability and audits, that's another uh, challenge and uh, focus area to make sure that we have a good understanding about our portfolio and to make sure that we are fiscally and technically transparent. So these are our environmental budget. Um, the challenges, if um, you notice in FY18, um, Congress specifically add about $84 million just to environmental restoration program. And um, I think it's 40, 44 millions of those are uh, marked for PFAS. So there are uh, plenty of opportunities in emerging contaminants and emerging issues. And then in FY19, um, we are uh, about $36 million in additional. So our uh, program size is about um, $1 billion or so a year. This is on the environmental restoration. So um, hopefully most of us are familiar with, in the environmental restoration program, Department of Defense measure our success when uh, a site reach response complete. Response complete mean when you achieve your remedial objectives, basically. What are you trying to achieve at a site? When that is achieved, then that's how we measure our success. So most of our site, uh, the goal is about 90% um, by 2018, fiscal year 2018. So where are we? Uh, we're only about 80, 87% or so. So those 3% sites within the Department of the Navy represents more than 400 sites that we just cannot, um, cannot achieve uh, our objectives, basically. And then in 21, the goal is 95%. We're not even close. Our projection is only about 80, 88% or so. And I think that's applicable across uh, DOD across the surfaces. So, so our liability, this is basically we're not, we don't know at most sites whether we're going to achieve our objectives or not. So to account for the liability, we put in like 30 years rolling, right? Uh, to, to put a price tag. So even with just the 30 years rolling, uh, our CTC is about four point, cost to complete the CTC is about $4.5 billion. So we put together acquisition strategy. We just complete, so we have a long-term, quote unquote, long-term acquisition strategy, which is uh, every three years. So we have 19, FY19 to 21, and we just completed that. Um, the link that I provided in there, I think, this, yes, the link, um, has the acquis our acquisition strategy. So please visit the link and then um, look at the opportunities in there. But uh, the highlight is um, we have a identify total of 2.3 billion requirement between 19 and 21. Um, that we plan to put it into 148 new contract action uh, with total capacity of about 3.3 billion. So the objective is we would like to have the flexibility of having contract tools available 
at the same time, that's how we manage the cost and the risk um, and having maintaining the competition. Of course, um, as you all know, within the environmental programs, uh, often we have to deal with political, uh, also public feasibility. So just keep that in mind. That's the reason why we like to have the contract flexibility where we maintain cost reimbursable, large business, small business, uh, single award versus uh, multiple award contract for small and large business as well. So um, I mentioned our goal, uh, meeting small business at 43% and then uh, using fixed price between 60 to 65% with uh, multiple award contracts at 25% of our new requirement. So uh, this is important uh, to provide us with the flexibility I mentioned earlier. And also um, we have a leverage of the use of contract throughout uh, the enterprise. So, when you work on a contract, just make sure that um, sometimes contracts not only good for a region, however, uh, anybody can use it from like different regions. So please keep that in mind. Okay, challenges. So as I mentioned, I, I think this is the first year we actually receive authority and not uh, doing a continuing resolution. So it's very challenging for our 1102, for our contracting officer to execute everything at the third quarters of every year. So as a um, uh, industry, I would encourage to work closely with either the core, uh, the RPMs, the remedial project managers, or the acquisition to make sure that if you have some uh, a need that you identify, then you agree, work with uh, the RPMs, the core, uh, or the KO to make sure that everything is ready. So when, when uh, the authority arrives, or um, at the, even at the third quarter of the fiscal year, then everything is ready to go. So we need a lot of help in that. So then, uh, we have, because of the congressional plus up, um, $84 million last year, we did not expect that to come as well as uh, the next year. So there is uh, a lot of contracts, uh, for example, the clean contracts or the remedial action contracts with, uh, with um, high burn rate because of that. And not only we do it for the active, um, cleanup site, but also for the BRAC. So just keep that in mind uh, when you work uh, with um, the RPMs or the KO and the core on that. So we still try to have a better, um, shorten the time frame for the pre-award. Um, as industry, I think this is the area where you can help a lot. Uh, to make sure that ask question to make sure that these uh, pre-award time frame can be shortened, and then we still our uh, challenge area is we have a low utilization of Mac. So Macs are out there, however, there's some um, hesitant to use them. So if you're on a Mac or if you have um, or if you're interested in a future Mac, please uh, d work together um, to make sure that the selection criteria um, are like layout so then we can have uh, Mac to be used. So the, these are the um, burn rates. Um, as you can see, um, these are single award. And it, it, it's been used at much quicker rate than uh, the MAC. And MAC is a good contract vehicle. So um, ask question, work, 
and communicate to we would like to see that this utilization to be uh, pretty much on par with that, with the single award. Okay, proposed contract by capacity. Um, the charts show a different um, size of proposed contract. So between FY19 and 21, um, we have about seven contracts coming up uh, with the value of greater than a hundred million dollars. And those are uh, some small business and large business, um, especially with the uh, clean contract and racks, those are coming. Um, these contracts are by region. Um, so we have uh, land and Europe uh, with about 1.1 billion at 25 proposed contract action, uh, as well as the San Diego or South Southwest region um, at 1.1 at about 16 contract action. Um, the other one, um, our region at Port Huinimi or uh, Exwick, they mostly focus on R&D and like technical support. So they have a lot of new contracts that probably would be uh, attractive to small business. Um, the contracts involve mostly uh, R&D as well as innovation in technology. So please um, check with the point of contact at NAFAC XWIC if you're interested. Uh, I think this is uh, the most attractive for uh, small business. And again, um, the link, please visit the link. So these are uh, major contracts sorted by the value. And yes, uh, some of them were actually late. Um, that's what we're still struggling. The complete list of this is on the link I provided before. So that's the link and then visit our booth. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, great. So, uh, in innovation and uh, good guidance, Gennardi. I, I appreciate that. The, um, the Air Force presentation is uh, by Colonel Jason Campbell. He's the uh, Deputy Director of the Environmental Management uh, Division of AFKEC, uh, 97 graduate of the Air Force Academy and an MS in Engineering and Environmental Management. Okay, just in case anyone was wondering, I'm not the same Jason Campbell that played for the Redskins several years ago, so. Okay, all right, everyone's still awake. Okay, before I start, let me um, just kind of tell you a little bit about AFCAC and how we, we do environmental uh, management uh, in the Air Force. So if you're not familiar, AFCAC is the Air Force Civil Engineer Center. And uh, several years ago, we consolidated all of the uh, environmental services uh, at AFKEC, and we provide an enterprise-wide, um, you know, services for the entire Air Force. Um, we do, uh, we're broken out into uh, six divisions, our compliance, po policy, remediation, uh, operations, NEPA, and then our technical division. And uh, they all work together to kind of provide the, the uh, support we need ac across the portfolio. Um, uh, the operations division has uh, several uh, installation support sections that are scattered throughout the United States uh, to uh, support our actual installations. And then the installations themselves have uh, some, some environmental capability to kind of just do the day-to-day -day stuff uh, at, at the installation. But you know, most of the big, uh, you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with defense-defense contracts and things like that. Those are all managed at, at AFCEC. Uh, in San Antonio, so, all right, next slide down. All right, all right, here's overview, can't have a presentation without that. Okay, 
So big support, uh, what we support here, the big picture, uh, I'm not going to read the slide, but, you know, like I said, we, we provide the environmental, uh, you know, support for the entire Air Force, and so we're, we're dealing with a full gamut of environmental issues across, uh, across the Air Force. Okay, first I'll talk to you about the environmental quality. So our FY19, uh, we'll just jump right into execution strategy here, so no sense in messing around. Um, our execution strategy, we have this thing called the environmental task order. Uh, we, we, try to, we try to relate what we do in the engineer community to what the flyers are accustomed to and they're accustomed to the uh, air tasking order, so we, we kind of label it like that. Um, the ETO is uh, a combination of our fence to fence contracts, our NEPA and the Sykes Act and the and also the uh, enterprise-wide projects. Uh, ETO has a well over uh, 2,600 requirements on it, and then you can see the dollar value there. However, our, our current projected budget for FY19 is just uh, 200, 212 million. Uh, we usually carry a little bit more on the ETOs in case we get fallout money at the end of the year. We can have projects and things ready to execute should we get any additional dollars. Uh, one of the big focus areas for FY19 is going to be to consolidate our uh, fence defense contracts. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with those. Uh, in the next couple of slides, we'll, we'll uh, go over how those are going to be grouped. Um, again, these, these contracts provide our you know, the recurring services at the installation level. Um, we're going to uh, put some optional CLINs on there that will allow us to get after some non-recurring kind of uh, um, services. Um, just give us some flexibility as we, uh, as we address different issues. And um, pro the, our primary uh, execution agents are going to be GSA and, and USACE. Uh, I think you, USACE actually, I saw a couple of their uh, um, I think I don't, it wasn't, wasn't those. It was the ORC contracts I saw on their list. But then we're also using the, the GSA blanket purchase agreement. Um, so you can see over there in the uh, in the pie chart, those are the the agencies that, that we use to um, execution agents that we use. Again, GSA and USACE are, are you know they carry the heavy load. And then you could see how many fence to fence contracts are going to be expiring. So. So there in, uh, in FY19, we've got quite a few that are going to be expiring. So um, be on the lookout for, for those opportunities out there. So here's, uh, here's just a good old spreadsheet of the uh, FY19 acquisitions. We've indicated which ones based on, I think, dollar value and complexity that you know, we want to go to 8A small business for. And, and you can see how they're organized um, by region and then uh, also which installations will be covered under each of those contracts. So, and I think these slides are going to be available afterwards so you guys don't necessarily have to take pictures all the time. And then the FY20 to 23 uh, fence to fence acquisitions. Again, some of the, you know, we're still working out some of the, the, the mechanics for this, but uh, again, um, those, are, those are the contracts uh, in the out years. Okay, so on to environmental restoration. Uh, so our environmental restoration is kind of a, our legacy program was, uh, you know, again, covered, covered those two main programs with the uh, installation restoration and the, and the military munitions program. But our old uh, restoration program was comprised mostly of our performance-based contracts. And, you know, I think you all are, familiar with those on uh, where we just kind of tell you what we want to do and you guys figure out how to do it. Um, I think we learned a lot. Uh, most of our contracts were awarded uh, back in the 2012 to 15 time frame. So a lot of those contracts are coming up for uh, rebid. Um, we'll go over that in a little bit. But um, we learned a lot of lessons uh, in the performance-based contracts on not only, you know, maybe some of their limitations and shortcomings, uh, but also, you know, kind of from an internal perspective in the Air Force on how we, how we manage those. I don't think, um, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a career environmental uh, 
person, but uh, in talking to uh, my colleagues there, I think there was, um, we could have managed those a little differently. And so those are lessons learned for us as we go ahead and develop our new contracting vehicles, which we're gonna call the uh, optimized uh, restoration contracts, so the, or the ORCs. So you know, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So for FY19 through 25, uh, our program averages at 277 million uh, per year. And uh, so for FY19, we're going to, you know, remaining committed to the PB, the performance-based contracts that we, uh, that we still have. And, um, but again, they're expiring. You can see on the, the bar chart there, uh, you know, kind of the bow wave of, of contracting actions that we're going to have over the next course of the next, you know, five years or so. And uh, one of the things that, that really had a challenge with was addressing emergent con uh, contaminants. And uh, some, sometimes we were successful in doing, getting the uh, in-scope determinations uh, and, and being able to get after some of the emergent contaminants with our existing contracts, and, and other times we weren't. So we're going to look, you know, as we develop the orcs, we're going to look to make those vehicles a little bit more flexible um, so that we can address the emergent contaminants. Um, and uh, we rolled out the discussion about the orcs at the last industry day in August. I think some of you may have attended that. And we got some feedback from, from you all and also from the regulators. And, uh, and we're we incorporate that into the, into, as we refine those, those uh, contracts. And uh, those slides, if you weren't there, are still on the SAMI website, and they'll be there until the next, uh, the next industry day. So if you ever want to go on there and check that out. So, uh, you know, what is the, the uh, ORC? Uh, basically, it's, uh, you know, the old performance-based contract. But we, we're adding in, you know, we're incorporating the lessons learned to, to mitigate some things. And some of the key takeaways that we had from the executing the, the, uh, the performance-based contracts were um, the cleanup objectives. We need to make sure that those are realistic given the site conditions. Um, so clearly stating what those objectives are and, and making sure they're realistic um, and, and achievable is, is key. Um, and then the work plans need to clearly define the roles and responsibilities. Uh, um, I think, again, the way we, we kind of managed those contracts in the past was, you know, we said, hey, we, we awarded a contract to the contractor and it's his responsibility to make, you know, make sure he you know, meets it. And I think there was some, you know, kind of going back and forth with regulators and the contractor. And, and so I think we could, from a management perspective, we can do better, you know, uh, on our end. So you know, those work plans will lay out roles and responsibilities, not only the Air Force, but, you know, the contractor and, you know, who deals with who and that kind of stuff. And uh, we want to we want to be able to, you know, have these contracts be flexible so that they can address the emergent contaminant issues. And uh, and obviously, you know, the uh, communication between the between the regulators and the contractor and the Air Force needs to be open and we need to make sure we're working together to meet the goals. And really that, you know, the realistic, uh, you know, uh, objectives is, is critical and, and that really kind of gets after mitigating the risk to the contractor, so, you know, to all, to you all. Um, if, if those are realistic, uh, then, then you know, that mitigates and brings your risk down. The liability still lies with the Air Force, um, but, you know, the risk to you as a contractor is, is uh, somewhat uh, decreased. And, um, like I said, uh, USACE will be executing our FY20 uh, works, and that, that, those are the ones I saw on their spreadsheet, if uh, I think you pick some of those out. And uh, we're working with the 772nd uh, that uh, is an enterprise-wide um, enterprise uh, contracting squadron that supports AFCEC, and uh, we're working with them to see if uh, they can support us in uh, the 21 and beyond uh, ORC contracts. So, and for these, we're going to be using the uh, the best value, um, the best value uh, award determination, and and what we're looking for is we want you know when you so if you're going to bid on one of these, just make sure that you know you put some thought and you know and serious effort in, into um, 
you know, your strategy on how you're going to, um, you know, do the cleanup, you know, what technologies you're going to use and, and those sorts of things. And that'll help us as we, as we go down and, and take a look from a technically acceptable perspective and, and a value perspective on, who, you know, who would, who would best fit the bill for that particular contract. So again, you know, the kind of takeaway is that we really hope to mitigate some of the issues we had with the previous performance-based contracts with these new orcs um, going forward. So, all right. Uh, okay, in summary there, uh, the requirements for FY19 uh, far exceed the, uh, the funding, our funding level. I think that's a recurring theme for any, any of us up here. Um, and we're, we're, our program overall is about 12 million less than it was in FY19. So, uh, and uh, like I said, there's, we went over the multiple opportunities out there uh, for FY19. And, uh, and just the big, big one is, uh, you know, focusing on transition into those orcs. I didn't have, um, we didn't have any specific, uh, um, timing for the award of the orcs. So, um, if you if you need that information, you can. Uh, I got uh, Vivian and Juan Perez over here on the side. They're my phone a friend. And uh, so, if you have any specific technical questions, I'm not your guy. That would be those guys. But uh, you know, so if if you need uh, need more information about you know timing of the orcs and and that stuff kind of thing, we can. We can get those uh, rolled out. The uh, fence defense contracts, we did put an estimated award quarter in there to kind of give you guys an idea when those things will be rolling out. All of our contracts are advertised on Fed, Fed Biz Ops, so um, that's, you know, that's where you need to go to look for those. And then uh, I think also think uh, there's an AFCEC website that we, we post those as well. So if you're familiar with that site, um, you can also look on there. So. That's all I have. I'm all at stand between you and a beverage, so Thank I'll you. get off the floor. Good job. Good job. Before we uh, before we open this up for questions, uh, I want to turn the mic over for a couple minutes to Rick Cox, uh, Chairman of the SAME Environmental Committee. Rick. Okay. Um, I saw some of you this morning at our committee meeting. Thank you for showing up. It was uh, probably the largest attended uh, committee meeting. Uh, for this, and it keeps increasing. You're probably asking, well, how do I join the environmental committee? Well, you go to your SME.org login page and you check the box, join environmental committee. And that allows you to get information from us. We send out uh, monthly meeting agendas and other information. And you would have found out about a, a exciting webinar last week on innovative remediation techniques where we had EPA speaking. Uh, additionally, uh, you can get involved with the committee by volunteering to pr participate and present a webinar. And we're looking for ideas and, and you becoming involved either in moderating or presenting. And then finally, right now is a call for papers for JETC. I think the window's open until December 10th. And uh, we want to get uh, your submissions so we can represent the entire industry as well. Thank you. Okay, um, we've got a couple minutes for questions if anyone's got from, for uh, our panel. Anybody? I, I was gonna ask the question, what else can industry do to, to help you? I heard uh, innovation as an interest, Air Force has captured lessons. What, uh, what can industry do to help you and how do we, how do, we do that? Anybody? Since, since you told me what to say before we <laughs> started. Uh, you know, one, one of the big issues uh, for us is uh, the PFAS, PFOA. Um, right now, you know, from the, you know, the Air Force, and I imagine the other services are doing the same thing we are, but um, you know, we're, you know, we're ex you know, executing you know, based on policy and right now we're you know, using the circle process to address the uh, PFAS, PFOA issues. But um, as, you know, as policy and, and a standard gets you know, published by EPA, uh, uh, you know, I think 
you know, we're going to need to have those kind of innovative, uh, you know, cleanup solutions and technologies uh, out there. Um, and, and you guys are the folks that, you know, kind of lead the charge and all that. So I think, uh, you know, at, as we get a standard uh, and, and the policy gets developed, you know, you know, we'll, you know, probably roll into remediation. Right now we're just mitigating uh, and we only mitigate drinking water. So um, just I think that would be a, a, a big uh, growth area anyway. So. Okay, good. Anybody else? Gunnardi? So just to add on the, oh, oh, uh, can I just do one clarification? Um, when you go to the link, I, I was just informed that since we just finalized our uh, acquisition strategy, the document, it was just loaded a couple of days ago. So wait until tomorrow to go to the link, so then you'll get the latest. Okay, so that's first. Um, and the innovation that the technology can do. Um, to add on the PFAS, um, there are so many uncertainties on the chemicals and the needs are very real. Uh, when we have uh, direct exposure to drinking water, we have to mitigate it right away. Um, we could just replace the water with bottled water. Uh, however, that bottled water is not a long-term solution. So uh, the need is right now. And, uh, if you're in the small business, please uh, also take a look at uh, DOD, R&D programs, um, CERDIP, and ESTCP. Um, if you have not heard it, please go to their website, um, e, uh, S-E-R-D-P, and then uh, ESTCP. Um, participate through uh, the R&D community because um, the ESTCP and CERDIP uh, their mission is to translate research into something that can be field, uh, fielding, I guess, uh, within uh, two or three years. I know it's not fast enough, but if you, if you can help uh, contribute, look at technologies for not only treating drinking water, uh, treating um, IDW, like uh, the investigation derived water, because when we take sample, uh, we, we have waste, uh, not only soil, but uh, also water. That needs to be treated too. So uh, look into those opportunity. And the other thing is low hanging fruit. So if you see a solicitation, right, um, on long-term monitoring. Just don't take a look at it as, well, oh, this is long-term monitoring is easy. You just like cruise control. Do not, please do not do that. Look at innovation. Um, petroleum site, if you uh, have dealt with petroleum site, if it's under circla, ask question, why is it under circla? Why cannot, why can it be expedited through a state program? And then also look at the innovation in terms of this long-term monitoring. Long-term monitoring, there's a lot more advancement in technology, like passive sampler, um, not only uh, for the groundwater, but you can do it in the sediment. Just take a look at those innovation as well. I would offer two comments. Uh, one is, you already heard of technology. Uh, for instance, the clearing of the UXO out for the Honolulu district, without the right technology, you're just not gonna get the contract. This is not uh, the humanitarian demining classes I was taking 10 to 15 years ago. If you're not out there with technology, uh, doing it as safely, as efficiently as possible, the contracts just aren't gonna go to your company. Uh, the second comment, and I'm not, I worked in environmental engineering in college, uh, so that's been a few years ago, but I'm not sure what your industry voice in Congress is in environmental. Uh, we have certain industries that it is amazing the influence on our laws. So it's very easy to criticize Congress and our political figures out there. But at the end of the day, a lot of these folks are just out there trying to make it happen. They're trying to give us the tools and resources. And some of those committees and some of those lobbyists and those um, associations have an amazing influence up there on the hills, on, on the hill. So if you're not using them, you're not banding together, not necessarily just for one project, but for to solve solutions and offer solutions and offer language that will help us achieve objectives, uh, you're falling behind. I mean, it's there, uh, especially this administration. They're business people. They want stuff done. They want it done yesterday, and they 
are frustrated with 50 or 60 year old processes. So have a voice, use your voice, band together, and go walk the halls if that's what is required. That's what I'd offer. Good, good. Thank you. Appreciate that uh, that, I, that advice. We're out of we're out of time for questions. If you want to talk to our panelists, they will be here. Thank you all very much, and a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>